Hello and welcome back. Today we are continuing our Victoria 3 tutorial series and we are going to be talking about the biggest economic change in patch 1.5, which is the introduction of local prices. Way more important um, than corporations, this is also sometimes called MAPI, which refers to the modifier which determines just how local your prices are, which is the Market Access Price Impact Modifier or MAPI. In this video we will be first giving kind of a little bit of a rundown or an explanation of how exactly local prices work. Following that we will be going into some spreadsheets and math and discussing with kind of a more fine-tooth comb what these uh, what exactly this mechanic is going to mean and how we need to think about different industries as a result of this mechanic and finally we will be discussing you know at least three examples of uh, mappy in action and ways we can inform our decision making around this new mechanic of local prices slash mappy without further ado let's get into it Now, before we talk about local price, it's worth discussing exactly how price calculation works in general, because a reminder, while it's something that's relatively basic, is important, um, you know, for making sense of local prices, which is actually a weighted average. So the way it works is if there's exactly the same number of buy and sell orders in the market, it will trend towards the base price. So you see here, steel has a base price of 50. There's roughly the same number of buy and sell orders. The price is not uh, increased or decreased. If there was instead plus uh, or double the buy orders that there were sell orders or really high demand, their price would be plus 75 and this scales linearly. This is the absolute ceiling, at which case you start running, you know, shortage penalties. Uh, the reverse is true at double the number of sell orders as buy orders, it will trend towards minus 75. This is the absolute floor. The price cannot decrease between this. This is linear. And so if you are halfway in between, as you can see, you have uh, one and a half times the sell orders of buy orders here for wine, you will get uh, 37 or 37 and a half, roughly halfway in between that 0% modified and also minus 75. And this is important because the way local price is calculated is, is calculated using a weighted average. So for talking about this weighted average, we're actually going to um, introduce a term that's not present in the game, but I think makes things a little bit, little bit less confusing because it seems to be the case that the term local price refers to two different things simultaneously, and one of these things is used to calculate the other thing. And so this column, it says local price for the duration of this discussion in this section, we are going to call this the real price. This is the price that is getting paid in GNZ. This price that is under local price. As we discussed how price was calculated, however, though, if you have more than double of the amount of buy orders of sell orders, you will trend towards plus 75. So the price of GNZ, if GNZ were completely cut off from the market for iron, since it has no sell orders and 10,000 buy orders, would be plus 75. That's not what the local price says. This is the real price. This is the price that's getting paid on GNZ. This is the weighted average. The market price for us is 43, and you see that the local price is a little bit higher. What local prices does is it pulls everything in a direction that is always going to be bad for you. And if we take a look and we click in GNZ, we will see that our MAPI or market access price impact is 95%. What this means is that 95% of the price is informed by our market price. Coming back here, that is this value here. So 95% or 0.95, that is the weight, times this is added to the local price, not this local price, not this real price, but the local price that we would get if we were to calculate it cut off from the market, where we have way over double the buy orders than the sell orders, the shortage price. And so, 0.05 times that price, which is 75, is added to 0.95 times the market price in order to get the real price, which we can see in this column, which is also called the local price. Uh, so the way it's working is this MAPI number is going to determine exactly how good the weight is for you. And it is always going to be bad for you to have a lower MAPI. It will always be bad. So let's take a little look at why it's always bad. So if we look at the economy of GNZ, we see that we have 10,000 buy orders of iron here. If we take a closer look at what the iron's going into, it is going into principally steel. The way that the steel value or balance is getting calculated is it's taking the output good minus the input good, which notably includes iron, 
and it is also subtracting wages and we're getting this as the balance this is the value that's getting added to society in addition to the wages and so we want this value to be higher if we increase the iron we are decreasing this value now coming back into here and looking at the local price here we can see that we are paying two percent more for iron as a result of the local price mechanic or the influence of the 5% MAPI. And so we are paying more, and so this is making our iron place more profitable. If we look at the other state of things, which is when MAPI is decreasing prices, note, uh, you can see that, for example, let's find a good example of something that is way lower in price. You can see we are producing a glut, a very large glut of glass. We are almost producing double um, or actually we're producing more than double our production. So this means it's going to pull the glass price down. We are producing more glass than we are consuming here, which means if we come into the glass factory and take a closer look, we are producing this all this glass, right? But the price has been lowered by the market access price impact or MAPI or local prices. It is lowering the price, which means our weekly balance will be worse. If this were 4% higher, right, then we would have a larger figure on the weekly balance. And so the way it works is when you are having more sell orders of a good, you are going to want that good to be more expensive because this means that your industries will be more profitable. When you have more buy orders of the good, it's going to be vice versa. When you have more sell orders, it's always going to pull the price down. And when you have more buy orders, uh, a la the iron here, it's always going to pull the price up. And so no matter what, more industries will be disaffected. Yes, we are consuming some amount of glass here. There are going to be some, uh, you know, places that benefit. So for example, we're consuming glass in the urban center. The urban center's weekly balance is going to be positively affected, right? As a result of, uh, you know, the price being uh, lower. But we are overall going to have more instances of glass being sold, the glass being purchased. And so this means we are going to have more instances of this glassworks, you know, price being lower and us having less of a weekly balance as a consequence of this. This will always, always, always be negative. And so let's take another look at an example. So we are going to take a look at Southern Manchuria's local prices and we see the reverse effect. Southern Manchuria is producing, you know, a whole ton of iron and this is going into the market right and this is one of the reasons why the market price is lower even though places like GXZ are consuming way more but if we take a look we are producing a roughly five times the amount of iron than we are consuming here and the price is depressed the price is lower notably our MAPI here is also worse. Our MAPI here is only 90%, not 95%. And so as this number decreases, it's going to greatly or more greatly uh, disaffect you know, various things in the market. Taking a look here, if we look at the iron mines, this iron mine, we would prefer this price to be higher because then our weekly balance would be better. So the iron mines in Southern Manchuria are selling, you know, to GNZ here. And then GNZ is getting a worse price. Shangz is getting a worse price. Or sorry, Southern Manchuria is getting a worse price, right? And, and this is critically important to emphasize. Both states are getting a worse price as a result of them, you know, selling to each other. However, when we have both the goods locally, in the case of Shangzi, we have an enormous amount of consumption, and also we have an enormous amount of production, then we get better prices on both, right? And so the way this is going to work is, well, let's ignore the iron for a second, but let's look, or sorry, let's ignore the steel for a second, let's look at the iron. The, pri the buy and sell orders for iron are roughly equivalent. There's 2K more sell orders or than there are buy orders, but roughly speaking, they're equivalent such that the price is barely being moved. And so what this means is that the iron mine is going to get to sell at a higher price, right? If we think about Southern Manchuria's iron mine, it has to sell at a lower price. In Shangzi, it is selling at a roughly even price here, right? And then it is also getting bought by this steel, uh, you know, factory here. And the steel factory is getting to buy it at a lower price because the price is not being driven up like how it is here in Jiangxi. And so what you would want as a result of having, here, let's get to the iron. 
What you want as a result of this mechanic is you want to be having both your buy and your sell orders in the same place, and then you will get to buy and sell at better prices. In the case of the iron in Shangzi, uh, it is going to be sold to the, uh, the steel mills at a better price, and it's going to get bought from the iron mines at a better price, and so both will be more profitable. And so what this means is you are going to want areas to be vertically integrated, uh, you know, and have both buy and sell orders in the same place we get to sell for more and we get to buy for cheaper and this overall effect helps our economy so anytime you are you know uh utilizing a price uh, that is the local price or informed more by the local price now we're talking about the balance here the local price not the real price anytime it's more informed by the local price this is going to negatively affect your bottom line and so what you want is you want your actual real price the price you're actually paying to be the same as the market price because this is going to positively affect you and so this is why mappy is so critically important uh you know important to note here the mappy in jiang z was better we have 95 mappy courtesy of you know the Yangtze River, which is giving five percent market access price impact, which is why you know we are getting a better price here than we were in Manchuria, where we were more disaffected by the mechanic of having you know an enormous amount of production. Uh, you can see the price figures plus thirty percent, you know minus seven percent are a lot more robust and are going to eat into our profits a lot more than plus nine percent and minus four percent. Now, if we look at a place like Sokoto, we can. See see that they are very severely disaffected by Mappy, paying 180% more, you know, for sugar, for example, where the market price is uh, absolutely guttedly low, and then it's middling price in this province, and then also, you know, paying or getting paid a lot less for the fertilizer and the tobacco that they are producing here. Uh, so let's talk about sources of Mappy. There are two negative modifiers, and if we look, we can see one of the, if we look, we can see, if we look we can see one of the negative modifiers here which is traditionalism you get minus 15 percent mappy from traditionalism you also get a minus 10 percent mappy penalty uh, from being unincorporated so you see here we should have a mappy of 90 here but instead we can't hover a tooltip to save our life and we will be getting a 10 percent mappy penalty from being unincorporated there are a whole bunch of positive mappy penalty or Mappy penalties. There are positive Mappy modifiers, starting with the stock exchange technology, which has critically become probably the first research technology for everyone except for Great Xing, uh, who researches something else first. If you don't have stock exchange, you probably want to research it first, as literally everyone but Xing. Um, so that's a plus 10% market access price impact modifier, plus Zeppelins, which gives plus 5%, and macroeconomics, which gives plus 5%. The base value is 75% and so if you are not on traditionalism and you're incorporated and you have all these technologies you will have a value of 90% that's the base of 75 plus 10 85 which is kind of your early game mappy uh, after zeppelins it's 90 which is where we are currently in this game and after macroeconomics it's 95 the other source of mappy is going to be rivers of which there are several this is not necessarily supposed to be an exhaustive list but for example the young the river in uh, China gives a 5% market access price impact modifier. The Yellow River, much the same. Uh, the uh, let's see, the Ganges also gives 5%. Uh, the Danube also gives 5% here. Uh, the Rhine River is also going to give 5%. And also the Mississippi River gives 5%. I think I'm li li leaving out some number, uh, but the important thing to note is that rivers do also give Mappy. And so it is possible to get 100% Mappy if you have one of these rivers and all of the technology and you are not on traditionalism and you are also in Incorporated. Getting off of traditionalism is going to be very important. And just to kind of fill in the blank on the information, the reason why you do not research as great Xing, in my estimation, stock exchanges first, is because you want to instead research romanticism so that you can swap off of, uh, swap onto agrarianism and off of, and swap off of uh, the very, very nasty traditionalism, which is going to give you 
a 15% market access price impact penalty. You notice in GXZ, we weren't really that disaffected, uh, you know, very much by prices. Um, you know, having to sell something at a minus 20% price is really gonna gut your profits. It's barely moving here where we have 95% MAPI relative to, you know, the example of Sokoto over here. Now, the most basic strategic explanation for what you want to do is kind of illustrated by when we looked at Cheng Zi and we saw that we had, you know, equal, near equal buy and sell orders. We weren't disaffected by MAPI in this way. And so we had more profitable opportunities on both ends of our iron, both when we're selling it and when we're buying it. So the most simple explanation is you want to build and consume all of your stuff in the exact same spot. However, this is not always possible. And so when it is not possible, we need a robust strategy to inform what exactly we should be doing when we can't get exactly what we want in regards to being able to build everything uh, everywhere because not every resource is in every state. We don't have rubber here, for example, and we don't also have lead here. So we're going to need to bust out the spreadsheet. If you have a children on, or a child, if you have a children, if you have a child under the age of 13, you might want to ask them to leave the room because there's going to be spreadsheets. <laughs> So here we have a spreadsheet that has at a glance, you know, uh, three different examples when we have a market price of zero, when we have a market price of 40%, and when we have a market price of 75%. You can invert this for minus uh, 40 and minus 75. It's going to kind of have the same looking effect. And we have, uh, you know, cells with outputs uh, when we have 60% MAPI, 70% MAPI, 75, etc. And then also two conditions. One, when we are having a glut of, uh, you know, goods, how will the price be affected? And by glut, I mean when we have double the sell orders or more than we do the buy orders in the local price, not the real price, right? And then here we have what will happen when their opposite is true, when we have a shortage, that is when we have double the buy orders, then we have the sell orders. And so you can see here when the map is low, man oh man are you absolutely punished a 30 percent penalty to your prices and this can be prices at both ends right because you could be paying more if you have a shortage you could be paying more for your input goods and then if you have an absolute glut if you're producing extra of something like in the case of steel you know coming back into the game in the case of steel and gxz we had two conditions that were bad right uh we had uh in our steel we had no supply we had zero supply uh, of iron here. There's no iron here, so it's all going to be increased in price. And we had an absolute glut, an enormous amount of steel that is getting produced here. And so this means we would be disaffected or we would be malaffected in two ways here. Coming back into the browser, we would be having the glut of steel, so we'd sell at a minus 30% price, and we would have input goods that are plus 30%, we would be absolutely getting crushed here right and so this is important to emphasize this is worse than just the profits decreasing by 30 percent this is crushing the prices the profits are the margins between prices and so we'll discuss this a little bit more later but this is just an illustration of how much you get crushed when your map is really really low conversely when your map is really high you're not really that disaffected although you will be disaffected and you care for some industries more than others you can notice uh, for example if we are at a shortage in the market this doesn't change anything when we have a shortage locally. We will be paying the exact same price. And so when we have a high price and we have, you know, a local shortage, this actually will change the price less. You can see here, uh, in addition to having where will the price lie, we have how much does the price change relative to the price that, uh, you know, is the market price. And so you see here, we're only changing 14% in this condition because the market price is high. So even though we have a shortage, it's not going to be as, uh, you know, negative a condition. And so also coming in here, um, you will see the opposite is also true. When you are having a market shortage overall, and you have a local, uh, you know, or sorry, when you have yeah a market shortage overall and you have a local glut, something actually terrible can happen, which is the price gets extremely depressed. And so sometimes you like at minus 60, it's even possible that some buildings can't employ up even though you're running overall uh, a deficit in the market because minus 46% price, it's still gonna be at minus 6% price. So you will actually be able to employ up, but man oh man, does this crush the profit of the building that is supplying the other good. So, you know, coming back 
back to a place like Ethiopia, where they're going to have a very, very, you know, first of all, you don't start out with good tech here, but also you have this terrible thing where you, uh, you have states that have iron and no wood, and you have states that have wood and no iron. So when you go to make your tooling workshops, man, you can't make things work. And then if we take a look at Gonder, let's take a look at their local prices, we will see, uh, you know, that they have, okay, roughly even on the wood, but you see here, they're paying way, way more on this iron because they have no inputs of the iron. And so um, this is just kind of an illustration uh, coming back into the browser of the various prices you get under certain conditions conditions uh, just to kind of visualize it as a whole and also note that it is particularly acute. Let's take a look at some closer at some PMs. So in regards to MAPI or local price considerations, not all PMs and industries are created equal. In particular, some will be a lot more sensitive or disaffected by MAPI. And uh, let's kind of take a look at why. So the, the spreadsheet has a lot going on, but the values we really wanna focus on are inputs, which is the price of all of the input goods multiplied by their quantity, their base price multiplied by their quantity. So if we're focusing on the opium plantations, on automatic irrigation, the price of the inputs, which is engines, is 300. And then the output is going to be, you know, so the base price of the output goods multiplied by their quantity and this is how we get the output and the net is of course the output minus the input um, and here we have this tab which notes efficiency uh, in terms of efficiency this is the output divided by the input and you can think of efficiency as your mappy sensitivity in some sense because you note if we come over to the mappy thing and we think hey at this 60 percent condition what's going on where we have minus 30 percent price plus 30 percent price if we assume that we are getting engines somewhere else so we're having we're getting punished by the mappy you can see that this is going to have uh you know this is column with a bunch of things going on but if we just increase this price by 30 percent let's say right uh, in which case we will go to 390 and we decrease this by 30% uh, or let's not decrease it by exactly 30% because you don't ever want to do math on stream but let's say it's minus uh, 600 so we'll put it in 1900 you will see we still have a net we're still going to be positive uh, on our building you know and this net will have to cover wages but once it covers wages that the rest will be profit and so relatively speaking Opium is extraordinarily resilient um, to negative MAPI because the net is going to be so big and so you're relatively resilient, which is this resiliency, by the way, this efficiency is also why you can get really depressed opium prices and still be producing opium and still be hiring at the buildings. You may notice that with the case of steel, you almost never have really, really cheap steel because the equilibrium employment will not allow it. Steel is one of the least efficient industries in the game, and we mean this from an efficiency perspective of the outputs minus the inputs. Uh, if you notice here, the net is not very big at all relative to the size of the output, right? And so if we were to, let's say, decrease the price of the output by a third and increase you know, the price of the inputs, well, we don't even have to increase the price of the output, uh, inputs. If the output is decreased in price, right, we are already, it's a, we're unprofitable. We have to fire down. We can't possibly employ up this much. And so what this is going to mean is that some industries, it's really going to matter a whole lot more that you are sensitive to their mappy than others. In particular, the resource industries, you can ship and you can sell them at a lower price and buy them at a lower price because the resource industries in general are so disgustingly efficient uh, you know stuff like a diesel pump engine or even condensing pump engine has double the output than the input uh, so this is going to be incredibly resilient we see efficiency of 229 percent this is kind of early game and it gets even better when you have dynamite right agriculture is the most efficient overall uh, because their input goods are very 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 low and so you are going to care less and you don't mind you know uh, getting these uh, somewhere else and then selling them somewhere else however with the industrial goods generally speaking the efficiency isn't very good so you really want to avoid a situation where like let's say hypothetically if we have a steel mill right we have a steel mill and we're getting iron from somewhere else like we were with GNZ and then we're selling that steel to the tooling workshop in another state 
this is going to be apocalyptically bad for the steel. And so this is going to really crush the profitability because our margins relative to the price of the goods are so tight. So in particular, and especially with steel, you want their sell orders to be in the same place. You can't always control that their buy orders are in the same place, right? Or sorry, you want to make sure that their buy orders for steel are in the same place as the sell orders. You can't control what you your inputs that strongly. Sometimes you're not going to be able to build the steel um, where you have the inputs. However, you don't want to be creating a situation where you are producing steel somewhere and there's not local consumption of that steel. You do not want to produce steel and then ship it because you're so disgustingly inefficient here. Now, uh, if your inputs are really, really efficient, you can kind of ignore this to some extent. So if we take a look at consumer goods, and uh, I'm not 100% sure I have the consumer goods for uh, you know uh, 1.5 in here. Uh, I think they're updated, but I'm not 100% sure. If at least for the textiles, I know the steel we updated, uh, as well as a lot of the other ones we looked at. But um, you know, if we take a look at the textiles, we see it's not the most efficient, right? Um, but dyes, uh, which if let's kind of take a look in game again, dyes are going to be extremely efficient. Almost all the inputs for. Um, you know, clothing are going to be extraordinarily efficient. So you can really pull down the price of all of these in the market relatively easy because you're efficient and you can afford the mappy. So the fact that an enormous portion of your stuff is, you know, fabric, silk, and dyes, and you can really decrease those prices, that's going to make it easier to maintain these margins. These inputs being agrarian are much more efficient overall jumping back into the browser than even the resource industries which are quite efficient and so uh you know in particular you're going to want to keep in mind um this efficiency notion or this notion that uh the better your inputs and your outputs like or the more the bigger the margin between your output good cost and your input good cost the less you are going to be disaffected when a price jumps uh like so for example paper bleaching we see the output is 200%. This is so much better than the 129% of steel mills. Steel mills is really truly one of the worst. And steel is an important good. It's not like it's a bad good. It's not like you shouldn't build steel. But you should never try and really decrease the price of steel because that means you're way overbuilding it if you're trying to get the price of steel low. This by its nature, just kind of in a broader like discussion about the game, uh, you are going to really be willing to tolerate a slightly high steel price, and you're going to have to tolerate, you know, sometimes really decreased prices of opiums in terms of the equilibrium prices that you're reaching while still being efficient. But this is a bit of a tangent. If we just kind of just take another look at example of the paper mills, if we decrease the price of the paper mills, you know, by 30%, go at 2100, just input that here, and we increase the price of the inputs by 30%, now Ever do math on stream oh man what is the price of oh my god this is terrible we'll just say 1800 you will see that we still have a margin to work with we still have to pay out all the workers and this margin is not very good but like something like paper you can get away with doing some of this stuff but in particular steel and steel is a really important one because of steel frame buildings. And so that's kind of kind of inform our strategy down the line, but let's talk about some other things too. So the next thing we want to talk about is actually trade. I've suggested to the devs that companies should give a trade bonus to allow specialization, but coming in, trade is very significantly disaffected by Mappy on both ends. And the way this is, is because when we create, you know, a sell order for trade, you can see we're creating trade routes for rubber, we're creating sell orders for trade routes. This only affects our real price in, you know, local areas. This only affects the real price to the extent that the market price informs it. So in GNZ, this, so this trade is only going to inform 95% of our price at GNZ, right? Because we have a mappy here. If we take a look, uh, well, let's not look at the local good when talking about it. We have a mappy here of 95%. So this means that this a decrease because this sell order is only going to affect the market price. It only affects the market price. It doesn't affect any price anywhere. Where you have the trade center, it's not like they offload it and it's cheaper there. It's only affecting this. And so this means that your ability to pull prices down 
uh, as a result of trade is negatively affected um, by this. And by the way, this is going to make trade way worse for someone like Sakoto, right? When they had that 70% mappy. Uh, so if they try and import to solve this like really expensive price, this is only going to affect their market price. It's not going to affect uh, you know, their local price uh, in a direct way. And instead, it's only going to affect uh, their price 70% in terms of their market. And so trade is way less useful than it was before. So in 1.5, if you're feeling like trade is kind of sluggish, this is a big reason why trade is sluggish. On the same token, we are like exporting a ton, um, you know, for us in, uh, we are exporting a ton of goods, uh, like in particular clothing. And you might notice, wow, we have cheaper clothing here. We are exporting this stuff in our market. Uh, we have more sell orders here than we do buy orders. So if we take a look at the market and we look at clothes, we will be able to see uh, that we are exporting and this is increasing the price. Um, yeah, so we are exporting it and this is increasing the price. However, this is only informed 95% of the price. So we would prefer to get a more expensive, we're really not exporting that much, but we would prefer to get a more expensive price here in GNZ because we would be more profitable if we were, because we have an excess of, you know, uh, sell orders than we do buy orders, but we're not getting a more expensive price or we're only getting 95% of that more expensive price. So in some sense, when we come in and we look at the society texts that give us, uh, you know, Mappy, you can think of these as globalizing texts because these will make trade a whole lot more useful at every stage of the game. You know, when you start getting towards 95% tech, trade should feel pretty close uh, to the way it did in 1.4. And when you're early game, trade should feel very, very sluggish. It doesn't move real prices that well because it's only informing roughly two-thirds to 85 percent you know of the price of the good where it is like actually in the states the real price the thing that is called local price here but you can think of it as the the real price you know like the actual true super local price if we come in here to formosa and we delete the ports we will get we will get the absolute uh, cutoff from the market. Yeah, we know we're getting cut off from the market. And now you can see, now this is what happens if it's 100% uh, you know, local price uh, determining the real price. You can see here, it is not pretty thing. And so this is what local prices turn us to towards. We get a, a whole bunch of like shortages and gluts and this type of thing. And so it's important to recognize that trade is significantly nerfed uh, by the effects of local prices. Finally, there is a very strong tension between both throughput and local prices. Uh, the more your mappy is, the more important throughput is, the lower your mappy is, uh, that is the more local prices inform your real prices, uh, the less important throughput is and the more important local price considerations are. Um, the reason for this, and this is also true because throughput gets better or economies of scale get better as you get more of it. Throughput's always good, but we're talking economies of scale or building around economies of scale. In previous, you know, 1.4, you would really, really push economies of scale as aggressively as possible. However, if we push economies of scale in the early game, you know, and we build all of our iron in one state, and then we build all of our coal in another state, uh, you know, suddenly we're gonna have a huge problem, right? We are going to have uh, a steel in a third state that is going to have absolutely abysmal prices uh, in various, and if we had a, the tools in an even another state, we would just have, we would get crushed. Uh, the steel mill would have to pay way more uh, for the, both the inputs of the iron and the coal because there's not being locally produced. And then, um, you know, the tooling workshop would have to pay more. The steel mill would get paid less. The economy would be a hot, hot mess. And you would do this before because you were looking to push economies of scale in individual areas and you only had so much infrastructure, so you would spread stuff out or you would build according to this weird economy of scale stuff. Now, that's really bad in the early game. However, economies of scale is still really good. And so uh, it's also good and gets better as the game goes on. The, in order to kind of explore this, we have to first explain why economies of scale has increasing marginal returns. When we build this fifth building, it's going to be worth 108% of a building. 
How do you figure? There's only 4% throughput. Well, the fifth building has a 4% throughput, so that's 104% of a building. But also further, the previous four buildings all gained 1% throughput, moving from 3% throughput to 4% throughput. And so the four buildings, that's 4%, and the additional marginal building getting 4%, that's 8%, or that's another 4% for a total of 8%. So it's worth 8% of the building. When you build your 51st building, that is when you get fully unlocked economies of scale following getting the shift work technology, which unlocks the last 20 levels of economies of scale bonus, then your marginal 51st building will be worth 100, or sorry, it'll be worth 200% of a building because you will be getting, uh, you know, the 50% throughput on the individual building you just built, and you will also be bringing the uh, 50 previous buildings from 49% throughput from economies of scale to 50% throughput from economies of scale. So on a per construction basis, this is incredibly valuable. However, if this is causing you to be having a glut or a shortage, jumping back into the browser real quick, if this is causing you to, ooh, that's not the browser, let's get the browser up, holy hot hell. If you are jumping in an industry and you are causing, uh, you know, it to, if this is causing a glut or plus 75 or approaching plus 75 locally, you know, as a result of pushing this economies of scale, uh, suddenly this is not going to be good if we had an even market price, but then we have a glut. We're overproducing because we are pushing economies of scale throughput and we have minus 18% on our price. Well, this might be tolerable and this might be worth it, you know, for the 200% of a building per construction type of thing. If we have an ability, a building that is highly resilient, a la the agriculture, you know, if we uh, increase, uh, or sorry, let's say we decrease this price, let's come over actually look at the mapping thing once more, we're getting a minus, let's call it minus 20%. Or let's call it here minus 11 percent let's call it minus 10. we have 85 percent mappy we're going to get minus 10 on our price if we decrease this by you know minus 10 this margin might be such that we're actually you know what we're okay uh, this is fine it's the throughput's more valuable however if we have something like steel where it's not very resilient to this at all pushing throughput from economies of scale on something like steel is going to be a lot worse um, in particular or specifically because you are not going to want to su uh, supply the rest of your economy as much with steel so steel you're going to want to build locally and in fact you can think of it as uh, building to demand is going to be a lot better on all your industries in general and it's going to be not as important as throughput maybe on both agriculture and resources it's just kind of the shorthand way of thinking about it uh, but there is this tension between you know if you are building to this economies of scale bonus you are kind of deviating from caring about local prices or MAPI. And if you're caring about local prices or MAPI, this is going to cause you to, you know, build like a level one, uh, you know, food industry in a whole bunch of different provinces or really low level food industries, really low level textiles, this type of stuff in a whole bunch of provinces. And so you are going to, when you don't have a lot of MAPI, you are going to want to, uh, you know, care really about local stuff. And then as you get more MAPI, and as you are adding trade, as you are getting this globalization f effect, you know, from unlocking these other techs that are giving you additional MAPI, uh, then you can start leaning into the throughput. But this is an important tension slash consideration that needs to be made when formulating a strategy around local prices. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs>
the most critical loop, um, even though we want kind of all of these things in the case of a rainbow state, the most critical loop is going to be having coal in a province and iron in a province. And this is going to be because in the early game in particular, um, the construction sector, uh, the iron frame building is just such an important uh, you know, feature of the early game and you are going to want to really, really have coal and iron states here. Now, having also sulfur is also going to be good in the early game for this iron frame building point and moving into steel frame that's when lead becomes important but let's kind of talk through uh, this building uh construction sector you know kind of loop uh if we are having construction construction being the most important way of growing your economy and this construction is eating the traditional iron frame buildings uh, or iron frame building goods uh, then what will happen is we are going to need a ton of iron we are going to need wood we are going to need tools we are going to want fabric but remember fabric is relatively resilient it has high efficiency so we could actually import fabric we could produce it elsewhere very efficient and so fabric's much less important so we want tools wood and iron okay well let's think what do tools wood and iron take well the iron is going to take coal as a result of the atmospheric engine plus tech. Um, the tools in particular are going to be constructed out of steel, so we will want steel. Steel has an input of iron and coal, and uh, the coal is also going to take as its input tools. The iron is going to take as its input tools. Tools are used in the construction sector, and iron is used in the construction sector. And so we get this nice tight loop as long as we have wood, coal, iron, and uh, yeah, just wood, coal, and iron, we can make this nice tight loop for the iron frame construction buildings. And then, then what we can do is we can, you know, we will have a relatively busy economy. One moment. Just swap to Prussia because this would be a little bit easier to explain. Um, we are going to have kind of this loop where we have a whole bunch of population. These population are laborers. This is driving up the local price for let's say something let's look and see if we have a negative balance well we don't have a negative balance of clothes but we could have a negative balance of clothes um wow they don't have any tooling tool here shame on them um and so if we have a negative balance for clothes if we have all these profitable industries and we're built up tall then the price being high on clothes locally is going to give us really good opportunities to build consumer goods where we already have all these industrial goods. But building up initially, you know, these industrial goods around, um, you know, iron, steel, uh, iron and coal and wood uh, so that we can facilitate kind of the biggest demand profile in the game is going to be really useful. And also, when we have local prices cheaper, this is going to make our construction costs as, you know, we are paying them out for construction goods considerably cheaper you know uh we saw the plus 10 plus 15 percent prices when we were looking at that spreadsheet that is big yikes if you imagine your construction good costs costing just 10 percent more that's not something you want and so you really really want to source them locally uh in this case so for the next example, or really kind of the next two examples, which are the two examples we're gonna look at, we're looking at GN, which in particular has an enormous amount of sulfur. And this is kind of, it doesn't have any iron, so it's not like a full mappy state, it's not looking good in the same way Silesia is. However, we can still loop some things together with you know, the sulfur mines. So we have a huge output of sulfur, we have a ton of resources for sulfur, so what can we produce pretty well here? Well, we can produce fertilizer, uh, right? Which feeds in from both sulfur and iron. So we are paying more for the iron here, but we're getting fertilizer. But the fertilizer then feeds into the explosives. And so all of the explosives inputs are here. Paper takes uh, sulfur. Uh, you know, sulfur, wood, and dyes. And so all of these input goods are going to be cheaper. So even though we're going to be selling some of the explosives, very likely, although we will use some with the sulfur, um, we uh, this is fine because we are getting all of our inputs at a cheaper price. And notably, synthetics plants is an interesting building because the PM for sulfur is disgustingly efficient. If we jump into the browser really quick and we look at the PM for sulfur without kind of drawing too much attention to it, on a per construction basis, you're adding an enormous amount of net per construction uh, you know you can ignore the chop chops being insane with focused hardwood because it's insane on the back of uh, the price of hardwood just always uh, the price of hardwood is just always going to get depressed and so it's not as good as it looks sulfur is the bee's knees so when you can create like local demand for sulfur even if stuff's not the most efficient this is going to be good so you know coming back into the game uh, synthetic plants is not the most efficient building in the game but it does create a lot of demand or buy orders for uh, you know 
of sulfur. And so we can get this sulfur factory to be pretty, pretty profitable in a way that's all kind of locally connected. The sulfur feeds into the fertilizer. The fertilizer and sulfur both feed into explosives and synthetic plants. The paper mills consume both sulfur and dyes, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the synthetic plants, and you can get a nice thing going. And also, you can do this in states in particular where you have sulfur, you have dyes, and if we scroll down in Xi'an, we're going to see that we also have silk and we have cotton. So we have all of the inputs here for the textile mills too. As long as we're not going on to elastics, we have everything kind of locally here. And then, you know, this is going to take tools and these are going to take tools. So we will have a lot of buy orders for tools. Now we might not be able to, uh, or well, in this case, we are doing the steel ourselves. We are just paying extra for the iron coming in, but we have plenty of, you know, buy orders for the steel uh, in the form of tools. Um, and well the tools also feed into it um, because ooh, do we not have a tooling thing we should have a tooling thing here let's just build that there to complete the the illusion of preparation and so uh, you will kind of be able to build an interesting uh, loops out of specifically when you have a lot of sulfur in a place this is notably also the case in uh, you know two Sicilies here where you have an absolute glut of sulfur and you also have you know silk and cotton you'll be able to do clothes plus uh, quite well now the other place I wanted to talk about was places like Punjab and Delhi which have uh, you know pretty monster state bonuses giving them agricultural plantations and on top of that these places have you know over 150 arable land um, and they have access to silk dyes and cotton with a huge bonus right silks dyes cotton and so this means they are going to be able to build uh you know clothing incredibly well because they will have really really cheap input prices and so this would mean their margins will be really well really really strong even though they're going to be selling these clothes elsewhere like if you build a level 200 clothing manufacturer you're going to sell it elsewhere this is also going to be uh you know very very uh strong or viable and so looking for opportunities to do local price sort of stuff you know build around what you have going on and trying to think of loops you can do like the sulfur loop the construction loop and the clothing loop are all going to be really useful and the final thing we're going to talk about is an example of Punjab so we're going to switch to Punjab because Punjab is an interesting country um, you know to talk about here in that uh, we have almost all of our population in one state so now we have a population problem we are we have a population in a place where we have a bunch of resources. So how are we supposed to play this? Well, I think if you have instances where almost all of your pops is in one place and migration's not going to be you know, fast enough because that's a lot of pops to move around, you are going to have to bite the bullet and you are going to have to build steel uh, in that place. So if we are them, we would have to build steel locally here and import the inputs for steel and then also you know look to have buy orders for steel so we will produce tools here and motor industries here and these tools and motor industries can you know feed into the dye plantations once we get on automatic irrigation this type of stuff and we're going to look to produce a clothing economy but we are going to be recognizing that we're eating an inefficiency on steels and a big part of why we are going to want to still build the steel here is because we want to construct a whole bunch here right and uh you know very critically construction sectors have an important output which is state construction efficiency if we're going to end up constructing a lot here as a result of it being a major population center we are going to want 15 construction sectors if we have 15 construction sectors despite the fact that we're going to be inputting the iron eventually we'll get on steel frame buildings and so we will want to build these manufactured goods remember you don't want to build your manufactured goods uh, somewhere else and ship them um, or you don't well you don't want to end up doing two things you don't want to build them somewhere else and then ship them or you don't want to uh, you know uh, if you're shipping them from somewhere else uh, this is perhaps fine as long as they have the local goods so if we somehow had Punjab and Silesia maybe it would make a sense to build the industrial goods here but what we're going to see a lot with Punjab especially if you're expanding you're going to see areas where you have iron but no coal or coal but no iron and so uh, you are going to in particular you're going to build here because it is your major population center. And so, you know, you're still being sensitive to the Tamapi considerations, but they are um, significantly changed. And I think Punjab is a very unique example. Um, but also kind of just as a takeaway for this, whenever you're evaluating a country, you know, a very game start, you're going to want to look and say, hey, 
where will I be able to build iron frame construction buildings or the loop for them as effectively as possible? You know, in the case of Prussia, we already say Silesia is going to be the state for them because they have everything. In a place like Russia, we actually might not choose the best mappy state from the consideration of having every resource. We might choose some place like Perm, where again, you're having this uh, tension because Perm has iron mines and logging throughput and so despite the fact that they're not going to have as profitable you know buildings once you get into the sulfur and the lead this might be a little bit more explosives but that is kind of uh the examples i wanted to talk about in regards to mappy <laughs> So that has been the tutorial on MAPI or local prices. Just to briefly summarize, local prices are a weighted average between, or sorry, a real price that it gets paid is a weighted average between the local price uh, that is determined by the local buy and sell orders. Uh, so if, for example, we are buying uh, extra ammo here, this would trend towards plus 75 locally. Uh, it's a weighted average between this local price uh, and the market price in order to get the real price, which is actually called the local price, which I think is a little bit confusing but I think explaining it in that way is a little bit better. Um, this is going to uh, uh, change things quite dramatically depending on how much MAPI you have. More MAPI is better. And if you have, a, in particular, a very small amount of MAPI, you will get huge price fluctuations that eat your profit in a very, very strong way. Because uh, when we're taking a look at, like, kind of our profit, when we're looking at a building, uh, the profit is the uh, the cost of the, uh, these goods minus these goods. So if you increase these, or if you decrease these goods, price by 20%, you are just absolutely going to completely crush the price, uh, the prices. And you can get these types of mappy changes or price changes when you have like particularly bad mappy. So kind of coming into East Houseland, you notice minus 24% with the, with the fertilizer output, that is absolutely crushing plus a 180% crushing. And so, um, you know, the, these are going to be, and this isn't even at like some obscene, like, uh, we don't have market access type of Mappy. This is at a mappy that is uh, conceivable to have in game 70, which is uh, the base is 75. But these guys have both traditionalism and stock exchange. We discussed the the sources of mappy. There are two things that uh, you know decrease mappy. Uh, in particular, uh, being on traditionalism is minus 15%, and being unincorporated is um, also minus. 10%, uh, you get MAPI, you get 5% from macroeconomics, 5% from Zeppelins, 10% from Stock Exchange, which is probably, you know, the auto rush tech in the game. Uh, and then you also get uh, plus 5% from some rivers, uh, an example of one being the Yangtze River. Um, we talked about how some industries are much more resilient to the effects of MAPI as a result of having just general more efficient, uh, the, the base price of their goods uh, divided by the base price of their inputs being much higher they are much more resilient to, to price changes in particular manufacturers are generally not very resilient in particular specifically steel is extraordinarily not resilient and examples of industries that are very very resilient to mappy uh, is going to be uh, pretty much all of your arable goods are going to be extraordinarily resilient and also your resource industries are also going to be fairly resilient um, we looked at some of the math uh, you know regarding some of this mappy and it's like when you're getting double digit price changes this is this is huge in terms of how much it disaffects stuff so it's very very important in the early game and it really does make these techs a really really strong stock exchange i, I think you just have to research it first we discussed uh, how there's a tension between playing for throughput and playing for you know which uh, is a very very strong mechanic because it makes construction extraordinarily efficient um, playing for throughput versus playing for local price considerations because often when you play for throughput you create an excess supply of goods and it'll give an area where you are producing way more of it than you're consuming which depresses the price which kills the profit and so when you have not a very good map you score you can't play for throughput as well but also when you get like over 31 buildings or something playing for throughput gets even stronger because you get increasing marginal returns on playing for throughput we also talked about how trade is greatly depressed by mappy um, we talked about uh, you know uh, several examples um, namely the most important one is being able to play for the construction loop which requires requires you to be able to source the stuff. Why did that not update? Um, be able to source the goods uh, specifically for iron frame in the early game 
being able to source all of these goods locally, which is going to make uh, places that have both iron and coal extremely important because uh, the tools will require steel, which is produced with both iron and coal, and iron requires uh, also coal in terms of its inputs, and so being able to spin up really, really profitable iron mines, it's dependent on having cheaper inputs in the form of coal, and also steel is very, very sensitive um, to Mappy, and so, uh, you know, the steel feeding into the tools, the tools are notably also in addition to being used in the construction sector, but used in all of the steel, the uh, the wood, the iron, and the coal, and so they're extremely important. But fabric, being less sensitive, can be sourced elsewhere, but you can also source it locally. And this is actually uh, maybe a condition in which you maybe want to supply a little bit of fabric locally, um, despite you know not wanting to build agrarian stuff early on. So that's kind of uh, the first example we talked about. We also talked about in GM, uh, thinking about the sulfur loop example, um, there's a lot of states that have a ton of sulfur and they can very nicely make you know fertilizer, paper, explosives, and synthetic plants in a way that feels nice and robust. Um, um, we also talked about, you know, some of these provinces, specifically in India, having all of these inputs for clothing and making that an interesting option. And then we also talked about instances where sometimes you just have to play to the fact that, um, you know, you have uh, an enormous population center in one area, in which case you should build a whole lot of your stuff there because you're definitely going to want to want construction sectors there because you're going to want this bonus to state construction efficiency where you have all of your pops because you want to get these guys employed and so in the specifics of Punjab even though despite you not having either coal or iron you probably want to build steel in the capital there so that was an interesting one I thought and that's just kind of a quick rundown of everything we talked about I hope you found this tutorial interesting I hope it wasn't too long because I mean it was a bit long I think a lot of these things were important to talk about uh, you know uh, in a way that wasn't like overly simplistic um anyways i hope you enjoyed feel free to like comment subscribe do the youtube algorithm thing mostly etc also etc and also have a good day